Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, you're all very welcome here to Clyde Road. Um, uh, this is my name is Fergal Cattle, and I am a member of the um, Structures and Construction Division here in Engineers Ireland. Um, tonight is a, um, a joint session between Engineers Ireland and IAPSI. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, IAPSI is uh, the International Association of Bridge and Structural. Uh, engineering and um, I suppose it's a, it's it's basically a knowledge sharing um, organization and uh, there's a, hopefully you'll be able to see that slide there it explains all about it uh, and I believe their website is iapsi.org if you want to find out a little bit more about that um, just a little bit of housekeeping um, this evening just for those of you who've joined us here in Clyde Road it's great to be back um, the fire escape is just behind you on the right, and then there's another one here down on the left. Um, if you could just check your mobile phones and just make sure that they're turned to silence, that'd be great. Um, also, uh, this is a, a hybrid event, so um, we're hopefully joined by uh, lots of you online, so you're very welcome. Um, we will have a questions and answer session at the end. Uh, I suppose I would just ask anyone at home that if you can't hear me, if you could put it in the chat, um, and um, we'll try and sort that out, but hopefully you, you can hear me. But uh, yeah, if you put your questions in the, the Q&A and then I'll ask um, our guests tonight uh, the questions afterwards. So uh, just in terms of um, our lecture, we have uh, two Arab engineers joining us and I'll introduce them in a second. And they're going to talk about um, uh, extending the service life of, I suppose, critical infrastructure, uh, something close uh, to my heart. So uh, it's very important. And um, uh, the, the project itself is based in uh, Holland and um, both uh, Pat Moore and uh, Richard Hornby are, are joining me here this evening and they've spent um, the last decade, possibly even longer, um, working with the Dutch Road Authority, uh, or WS, um, working on um, big steel bridges. I think you're going to concentrate on two steel bridges this evening and um, go through some of the lessons learned. Um, and uh, tell us all about it. So just I'm just going to introduce them now. Um, Richard Hornby is an Arab fellow. Um, he's over 40 years experience in the design and construction of bridges. His primary expertise is steel bridges, and he's worked both as a designer and a contractor. I um, can't believe that it's 40 years. You don't look like you've got 40 years in your but uh, yeah. Um, he, Richard was responsible for the independent design verification of Turkey's 1915 Kanakale Bridge, which is the world's longest suspension bridge uh, with a main span of 2,023 metres. Um, and over the past 13 years, Richard has provided assessment expertise to the Dutch Road Authority, or WS, and developed solutions for eight steel bridges uh, under their bridge renovation programme. And then also Pat Moore, who I know well, uh, is a Chartered Engineer and Associate Director at Arup. Pat has over 20 years experience in the design and renovation of bridges. Um, he supported the Dutch Road Authority in the delivery of their renovation program since 2012 and provides technical management expertise uh, pertaining to bridge inspection, assessment, strengthening and construction supervision. So uh, I'm just going to hand over to the guys now. Uh, thanks very much. Before, I suppose there was one more slide on the IAPSI. So one of the reasons we've had the, uh, the plug here for IAPSI is that these, um, there's an Irish group of IAPSI. Currently we have 12 members, so it's not a huge uh, contingency at the moment. So it was a bit dormant over the um, COVID period, but we're back active again. And we have a couple of activities planned for 2023. This being one, uh, there's also a, a talk planned with Ian Firth, uh, along with iStructD in May. And there's also a plan to bring the UK branch of IAPSI to Dublin to walk the Luffy and look at a few bridges and talk about a few bridges. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a, it's a an advertisement for, for engineers in Ireland to to see if they're interested to get involved. Um, the chair is is Marcus Sanchez and the uh, the secretary is Kieran Handley, so if you're interested, you can contact them or um, there's a, an email there. So um, that's uh, thanks for the introduction, Fargo. Uh, I probably don't need to say anything more. Maybe Richard, you would like to to say that. I just, just, I just say a couple of things, sort of a bit more of the left professional side, maybe. The um, uh, uh, I'm not a stranger to Ireland. In fact, the very first 
piece of professional work that I ever did was to contour the road as it comes off the, uh, the, the, the moving bridge in the middle of Waterford so that the water would find the gully without, um, uh, in the places that you could put a gully, without the cars disappearing off on adverse camber into the, <laughs> into the abyss. So that was the very first thing I ever did. And then my first international trip ever was to get a train from London uh, to, um, uh, to, to Milford Haven and then ferry to, to Ross Lair to hand over the contract drawings, get given lunch and come back again, um, because it was cheaper for uh, to employ a graduate to do that than to send DHL. Um, so those, those are my, my early experiences in, in, in Ireland. And then uh, uh, more, slightly more recently, just about the turn of the millennia, the, uh, my only Wikipedia entry of, with my name on it is the, or the originator of the pendulum launch for the Boyne Bridge or the, the, um, uh, the, the Mary McPierce Peace, Peace Bridge in, in Drogheda, where um, you could build the um, um, uh, entire superstructure at the same time as the, as the tower and pull it through the, through the pylon as a pendulum. I rather preferred the French, the French when they, they reported it in their engineering press, they called it the Tarzan. And so um, I, that was, that was my, my, my other sort of venture into Ireland for, for, for work. But that I think is me, and, and, and as Fergus said, 40 years in the business, almost entirely steel. I've done two buildings, a bit of Wembley and a bit of Chernobyl. Uh, so that's about it. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, the theme or the topic of the presentation is, is about extending the lifetime of critical infrastructure. Um, the presentation is going to be focused mostly on a program that's been ongoing in, in the Netherlands for, uh, since 2009. Um, yeah, the objective really is to, to give, I suppose, maybe some insights that me and Richard have from, from working on the project for over a decade. Um, What's key about these bridges is that they are critical in terms of any disturbance to these bridges has a major impact on the infrastructure and on the on the service. So for other asset owners, I think uh, some of these lessons will, will, will apply equally. Um, I'm going to give a, a summary of the, of the program and some of the key aspects as we see it. And then Richard is going to talk about some of the, the state of the art in terms of uh, the design and analysis of, of, of some of these bridges. And hopefully we'll have time then for some, some questions and answers afterwards. So yeah, the Dutch, um, there's a couple of slides here in terms of the context for the, the, the renovation program. So the, the Dutch uh, transport network, it's got a very extensive road network. It's got a rail network. And I guess probably more uniquely, it has quite an extensive waterway network in terms of, of rivers and, and canals. Um, another feature of, of the Netherlands is the presence of the port of Rotterdam. So the port of Rotterdam is the, the, the biggest um, port in, in, in Europe. Um, and consequently, there's a, there's a very large logistics and transport uh, industry around the port, both in terms of heavy, heavy goods traffic, shipping traffic, and also freight. Um, coupled with that, you've got a uh, high density of people. So you've got a lot of commuter traffic. Uh, and the net result is, yeah, there's a lot of congestion on the road network. Um, and it's a major, I suppose, a point for the for the industry to minimize that congestion. When we're dealing with yeah, bridges that are critical on that network, uh, they become um, a key focus. Right side to side are the uh, authority responsible for the um, development and maintenance of the, both the road network, but also the water network uh, in terms of the, the transport part and the flood defense. Uh, they have an annual budget of, of about 5 billion euros. Uh, and they, they're responsible for three and a half thousand kilometers of motorway and about four and a half thousand bridges. Um, so the the major, I suppose, construction period for the, the road network in particular was in the 60s and 70s. Uh, during that period, uh, there was a lot of large steel bridges built, long span bridges, crossing you know, large rivers, such as the Rhine and uh, many of the, the wider canals. Um, it was a time when uh, I think there was the first real application of computers in design. There was a significant amount of optimization done in terms of steel design and uh, the weight of, this, of the steel work. Um, 
Another thing to note is the, you know, the increase in demand, particularly in terms of traffic demand. Um, the, uh, the numbers of trucks from the 60s has steadily increased uh, on all of these bridges, and you know, they're projected to increase into the medium term at least. Um, so along with heavy truck numbers, you've also got uh, another feature, which was the, the, the move away from uh, dual tires to what's called super single tires. So these, this happened, I think, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it resulted in a lot more fuel efficiencies for, for the trucks, but does mean you've got higher pressures under the wheels. Um, and the thing that, that was the basis of commissioning the renovation program was the, was the poor fatigue performance of the orthotropic decks. Um, so I have a couple of slides here in terms of the orthotropic deck. So what you see yeah, uh, under the orthotropic deck is, is, a, is a typical deck where you've got a steel, steel girders longitudinally and then cross girders of steel and then a, a deck, which generally consists of, of, a, of, a, of a steel deck plate with some form of stiffening. And um, most of these bridges have, have U trough type stiffeners. Um, and what, what, what the common feature is, or the Achilles heel really of this, of this um, form of construction has been the, uh, yeah, the, the tendency for cracks to form at the, at the location of the, of the leg of the trough with the deck. And this is due partly to uh, the loading. So the, the, the intensity of the loading and the frequency of the loading but also due to the, the, the detailing. So what you see there is, is effectively a, a, a single-sided arch with penetration type weld with a lack of penetration, which is, which is a, a stress riser. And that's the point where uh, you get the crack initiation and then crack propagation. So yeah, these troughs are typically uh, six to eight millimeters in terms of the, the, the size, and, and typically the surfacing was, was of the order of 40 millimeters. So you're not getting a huge amount of dispersal of load. Um, once this starts to happen, then you have a, a regime of inspection that's needed to you know, determine where the cracks are occurring, and then you need to repair them. And the repairs progressively get more and more uh, complicated because once you repair a crack or repair a weld, when you have to repair it again, uh, a number of years later, the repair me method is, is more intrusive. This has led to yeah, more hindrance, more costs, and ultimately that leads the, the owner to, to get to the point where it, he needs or she needs to take more intervention. Generally, the decks are not the primary load-bearing uh, members, so their, their, their main function is to distribute the load to the, to the secondary members. So this has resulted in, in the program that we're talking about, which is eight large bridges located um, yeah, on the key transport uh, points uh, in the Netherlands. So they're generally located on, on main motorways and uh, waterways. The, the program started in 2009 and it's, it's still ongoing. We've finished, I'd say six and a half of the bridges out of eight. Um, client, as I said, is, is right side of that. Uh, the designers are ourselves, are along with Wallace Conning DHV. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a, a manage management contract type uh, contract. So we 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 do the assessment, the inspections, the strengthening, the design of the of the strengthening measures, and then the the tendering and the construction supervision. Uh, TNO have been part of the the technical review process. They work closely with Rexadasat. And uh, yeah, I think some of the things Richard will talk about also are, are done uh, together with TNO. The program was set up so it was a, a framework type contract. So you had uh, three contractors were, were part of the framework, um, Gavies, Structan, and Hymans. And the idea of this, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, is yeah, to use uh, a program to develop the knowledge uh, and that's, that can be achieved by using this framework of contractors and feeding that system uh, through the process. Um, for this presentation, we're going to talk mainly uh, as kind of with two reference bridges we're going to talk about. One is the Halakopper Bridge, which is located in, in Utrecht, in the middle of the country. And the second one is the Van Brienard Bridge, which is located in, uh, in Rotterdam. So, um, 
there's a couple of slides here just to summarize, I guess, the main works that were done on these bridges, and then we'll, we'll come back to them in terms of some of the uh, lessons or some of the aspects to highlight. Um, the Halicopper Bridge is a bridge carrying a motorway, so it carries two times six lanes of, 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 of uh, traffic over the Amsterdam Rhine Canal. It was built in 1970. Uh, it's a cable stay bridge. Well, There's actually two bridges identical, uh, cable stayed uh, with a single line of cables. Uh, main girders are, are steel eye girders and then an orthotropic deck. Um, carries about 200,000 vehicles a day, which if you compare with Westlink, I think is about 150,000 of that order. So um, it's the second busiest bridge in the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, yeah there are the spans, it's, it's 300 meters or 300 meters in length with a 180 meter main span. So it had, um, in terms of the condition of the bridge, it had problems with the, with the deck. So there was fatigue damage in the deck, uh, which meant there was yeah, ongoing repairs and maintenance. Um, there was also heavily loaded foundations. The superstructure had static and fatigue over utilizations and also the condition of the state cables was, was deteriorating. So in terms of the measures that were implemented and the interventions, um, there was a concrete overlay applied to the, to the deck and we'll, we'll touch on that a bit later. There was a global strengthening scheme applied. Um, we provided additional clearances. So there was additional headroom clearances provided over the, the, the river, the canal for shipping traffic. And as part of the, the strengthening, we provided extra uh, space for widening of the of the of the uh, for traffic, uh, and it's been necessary to to monitor the condition of the state cables, and there's currently a, a replacement of the cables happening. Second reference uh, bridge is the Van Greenor Bridge. Again, it it carries two times six lanes of traffic. Um, what's Slightly different about this bridge is that it's, it's two bridges or two systems of bridges, but they were built at different times. So uh, the first bridge, the, the bridge shown in orange, was built in 1965, and the other bridge was built in 1990. They consist of a steel pied arch, uh, 300 meter span, and on, on, on the northern side, there's a movable bridge with a, an 80 meter or 60, 50 meter openings. Um, an interesting thing, I suppose, here is that the, the movable bridge here that was built in 1990, it needed to be, it, the, the deck of the, the steel uh, leaf needed to be replaced about seven or eight years later. It was the, the bridge in which uh, the fatigue problem became apparent, uh, and that was the, the starting point for, for much of this program. Um, beside it is a bridge that was built in 1965. It's still open. It's, uh, it has a timber deck and it, it carries uh, about 100 and, 110,000 vehicles a day. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of a, a video that like, so I have made for communication purposes uh, about the Van Bridge. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share it here. So yeah, it's, this is the busiest bridge in the Netherlands, 230,000 vehicles a day, 120,000 ships a year going in and out of the port of Rotterdam. Um, it's the 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 older bridge is effectively at the end of its design life. It's had a, a long service for a bridge of this intensity, uh, and the fatigue is going to be a problem on the uh, on the on the on the on the newer bridge built in 1990. Um, this is one of several renovation projects that are happening in this province alone. So in South Holland, um, yeah, it's quite an urbanised part of Holland. Uh, and there's a number of, of renovations for, for tunnels and viaducts and bridges throughout the um, province. So the general and renovation plan is to renovate the two steel arch bridges and the older Basque Bridge. Um, uh, the Basque run, it'll, yeah, it'll happen from, uh, from now until 2027, probably 2028. Um, and yeah, the, there'll be a new Basque Bridge provided uh, at, the, at this location. Uh, also, there will be a replacement of the current mechanical systems and the control systems will be fully replaced and renewed. Offsite, uh, they will, will build a new steel arch bridge, 300 meters span, six lanes of traffic. Uh, it will then be transported 
from the fabrication yard to the site. At that location, it will replace the 1990 bridge. That 1990 bridge will be then bought away and renovated uh, offsite. Um, and when that's complete, it then will be brought back to the other side where it will replace the older 1965 bridge, which will then be available for anybody who needs a 300 meter long uh, arch bridge. This um, obviously has an impact on the traffic during the construction. So it has a major, as with local and regional impact on the shipping traffic and on the, uh, the road traffic. But once all that is done, the Rotterdam and Netherlands will have a new renovated bridge uh, with a design life of 100, and, uh, 100 years. Okay, so um, in terms of, I suppose, the lessons learned or the key aspects, uh, I've, I suppose, four themes that we, uh, I'm going to present something on. One is in terms of uh, service reliability. So these are pieces of infrastructure that are, that are currently providing a service. They're transporting uh, cars or ships, uh, allowing the passage. Uh, what's key for them is, is to, to safe and reliable service continues before, during, and after the renovation. Um, in terms of technical innovation, um, renovation projects, you're generally dealing with, with a, you're not, you don't have a, a blank piece of paper like a new build, so you have a, an existing bridge, uh, and often the techniques that are needed need some form of innovation. You're, you're, comp you're compromised, so uh, this, this, uh, this is another aspect. Asset management, um, yeah, I think what's key in terms of renovation projects is to understand the assets in order to be able to optimize the effectiveness and the timing of your interventions. Um, and finally, the risks. There are, there are different risks associated with renovation projects compared to uh, new build, and it's important that these risks you know, are, are well managed in order to be able to deliver renovation projects. So, I suppose on these themes and then looking back at the, the reference projects, um, one, of the, one of the main questions that are often uh, need to be answered at the start of a renovation project is the trade-off between uh, building a new bridge or renovating an existing bridge. Um, and I guess with, with, with infrastructure that's critical in terms of the, the service it's providing, often the option to, to build a new version is not really an option because the time it takes and the disruption it's gonna cause is not acceptable to the client. So for example, a helicopter, uh, I think Richard will say he, he, he do, and the first thing he did was he draw, drew a new bridge. Um, but in reality, the client couldn't accept the, 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 the hindrance and the, the impact of that. So once you, once you get to that point, then your, your renovation is all about minimizing the disruption. Um, so at Halicopper, the, the global strengthening scheme was to was to install 300 meter long steel girders either side of the bridge uh, to connect those girders to the to the to the existing bridge, and then to impose a deformation onto those strengthening girders to take over some of the load from the existing bridge to relieve the, the loads that were in the hangers or in the cables and in the, in the, in the main bridge. Um, this type of strengthening, you know, was able to be done with a small amount of hindrance, a little amount of hindrance on the road and the, and the river. We saw on the video about the, the method that they're using uh, at, at from Brainord. Again, at the earlier stages of that project, the, the plan was to actually do the renovation on the bridge. So to, you know, uh, improve the, the strength of the steelwork to replace the hangers to, 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 to do it on, on site. But, the consequences and the duration and the, the length of, of impact that was going to cause for traffic uh, became less and less acceptable uh, as the design developed. And so in the end, the solution has been this swapping of the arches, which uh, is a complex operation, but is fast and it decouples, I think, the impact uh, on the bridges from the traffic. So. The expectation is that the, the the bridges can be actually swapped in a in a in a in a in a in a short period of time, about three or four days for the actual swapping, and then the, the road itself may only be closed for five or six weeks. 
Um, in terms of the technical innovation, so one one of the the main developments on, on this program was the development of um, the high content, what's called the high strength concrete overlay, um, and the, the the theory behind this product is that it it solves the local fatigue problem. So. Uh, the solution is to you know, find the cracks that are currently in the deck, you repair those cracks, uh, and then you apply uh, a concrete layer on top of your steel deck. It, uh, it provides benefit in the fact that it, it, um, it disperses the loads better, and it also acts compositively with the steel deck. So your stress concentrations are reduced and you, you prolong your life of your bridge. Uh, and this has a, a design life of 30 years. So, um, and it was developed over a relatively long period of time by the client and then implemented on the program. Um, some of the downsides are the, the, the extra weight that it adds, and it, it can lead to then the need for yeah, strengthening elsewhere on the bridge because you've, uh, you've solved your local problem, but then you introduce a global problem. Um, one of the other aspects was the development of the the analytical tools that were needed to understand the fatigue problems that were happening, mainly to demonstrate that this solution would work. So uh, a lot of that work that was done in terms of the development of the analytical and the sophisticated analysis tools for, for the deck and the fatigue um, have been carried through into design work. And that's, that's some of the work that Richard will share. Um, in terms of the, the theme of asset management, I think one of the key aspects is, is to get the most out of your existing asset. So, um, yeah, the longer you can safely use your asset, the better, effectively. So, I think this 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 can be as was described in, in a number of aspects. One is is maintenance and, and data. So, all these bridges were not necessarily very old; they were very well maintained, um, but yeah, they still needed renovation. Um, the other aspect is the, the data. So these bridges, again, they 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 were built in the 60s onwards. They had very good uh, information in terms of the, the original calculations, the, the as-built drawings, the construction sequence, the site records, um, site photographs. There was quite a good uh, amount of data available, which for renovation means you, you're starting at a positive location in terms of you're not, you don't have to make necessarily assumptions or guesswork uh, and that's that's one aspect in, in enabling getting more out of your structure um on the loads and the action side um there's a number of areas where yeah you can you can uh, refine your your loading so typically for long span bridges uh, wind loading can be a governing load case so uh, on most of these bridges wind tunnel tests have been done to uh, determine the, the appropriate wind loading to use, which is usually better, more beneficial than using the default values in the, in the codes. Um, traffic load models or traffic models have been developed uh, for both static and fatigue verifications, uh, and also in terms of things like ship impact loading. So ship impact loading, again, is often a governing load case for, for bridges over, over rivers. Uh, Using probabilistic analysis and uh, portionality in terms of determining the, the 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 ship loading to use can give benefit in terms of demonstrating that your bridge is safe and it complies. On the analysis and the verification side, again, yeah, more refined analysis and more local models and 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 uh, and uh, more sophisticated uh, tools can be developed to to. To, to demonstrate the capacity and the hidden reserves of capacity. I guess one thing with all of this is that it, it, there's a bigger investment in time and, and money uh, often for renovation projects in terms of your design stage. So with a new bridge, you, know, you generally go to your code and you'll go to your uh, bridge you've designed before and you'll make a new bridge. For renovation bridges, there is a bigger investment uh, in if you want to get if you want to prolong, I suppose, and minimize as much as possible the the uh, the amount of renovation, but when you get to the renovation itself, in order to maximize that, um, it, it does mean a, a bigger investment probably in the in the design and uh, and the preparation stage. 
Um, structure out monitoring on that side of things. Yeah, again, you're, you're dealing with an existing structure, so you can you can implement structure out monitoring. Um, a good example is is from the helicopter bridge, which again I think Richard will probably talk about. Um, at the helicopter bridge, the the cables were in uh, had some wire breaks. The condition was deteriorating, and so then there needed to be uh, uh, effectively uh, an action taken in order to, to demonstrate safety of the bridge and to keep the bridge safe. So, with structure out monitoring, you can yeah, you can we could measure the loads in the cables. We could we could measure the, the traffic. So these these this information then gives you realistic loads that you're 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 you're, you're comfortable to use, and they can also be used. Structural monitoring can also be used to confirm. The analysis and the design that's been done because the cables were, were critical parts. So this is uh, what we call a bypass. So this this uh, design was effectively bypassing the the kind of weaker part of the cable, uh, but in order to demonstrate to the client that bridges continue to stay open safely, it was, uh, structural health monitoring was 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 necessary. So this bridge, I think, is, is monitored twenty four hours a day. Uh, it's been able to keep the bridge open without the need for any closure of the bridge, and it's given the time to, enough time to be able to uh, replace the cables in an orderly fashion. Um, under the theme of, of of managing risks with renovation projects, um, yeah, I think renovation projects inevitably, I would say, expect the unexpected. Um, Halicopter is a good example where in 2014, we applied the concrete overlay on the bridge. We, we applied the strengthening girders. About five years later, we're there replacing the expansion joints and the, and the bearings. And now we are replacing the, the, the cables and the, and the pylon and strengthening the pylons. So uh, inevitably, a lot of these bridges do end up with scope creep. Uh, so to manage that risk, I think it's important to yeah to have robust planning and budgets. I think communication uh, is very important in terms of because all of these types of structures are in the public eye because of the impact that they cause. So communication is also important, and yeah, contingencies and and uh, a plan B and maybe a plan C. Um, I think this is probably my last slide. So one other aspect related to the. Um, to managing risks is the is the is the you know the technical feasibility needs to be proven often uh, with renovation projects. So I think with, with new bridges, as I say, you've got a blank piece of paper. Uh, often you don't have to go very far, at least at the earlier stage of your projects, to demonstrate that it's it's feasible and it's going to work. Uh, with renovation projects, that's not always as as apparent. So there is more. Uh, time needed in the in the kind of design development stage. So again, the high strength concrete overlay will develop over a very relatively long period of time. The other uh, aspect is is the interface with construction techniques. So a lot of the renovation measures that you take are highly dependent on how you apply it, and uh, uh, the framework kind of cover that partly by having a, a group of contractors doing this work on two or three bridges and feeding that information back. So effectively you you um you you collectively demonstrate this feasibility. Um, so I think that's in terms of the, the procurement strategy for renovation projects. Yeah the 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 consideration needs to be given to yeah the level of design development you need to get to in order to demonstrate feasibility and to yeah to bring in the construction knowledge at that point in the, in, in, the, in the process rather than afterwards. So, state of the art, Richard. Hi, Beth. Um, I don't see, see those who come here, but see those who not see those who are on the, the, the virtual audience, but I'm um, very proud to be here. Um, uh, the, um, I've slightly extended the brief of of what was, even though we had a free choice of subject, really, we extended the brief of, of what we would cover here. But in, in essence, the message that we're, we're, we're talking about is that you know, existing structures and also new structures need to last, you know, we need to, we, we, need, we don't need to be, we mustn't be going down the same routes as we see here. 
where we're having to replace or to renovate structures that we build today. And we need to be looking at the lessons that we learned on historic, historic structures. And then also on our existing structures, we need to look at the solution space that exists for us in um, what we can do with them um, uh, with, with this sort of few sort of examples of what has been done on other, other projects. And then just one, one example of, you know, the, the, the work that we've done um, uh, it, uh, or, or in the Netherlands has been groundbreaking, breaking, I believe, in the development of an understanding of fatigue and steel decks. And that will now colour the way in which you need to look at um, uh, uh, steel decks in all bridges in all countries going forward, because this the there 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 the, you know it it, it, it was relatively um, rambling. So it's a sort of explanation of where we've taken it to in, in the future to explore the lives of those bridges themselves. So let's hope that goes the right way. So this is a bit historical um, uh, on the on, on the first bit. So as I say, the two structures on the left are sort of solution space so that I see someone in the audience here who was working with me back in um, uh, over over 30 years ago on Road and Commission Bridge in Cologne, whereby we were looking at an existing suspension bridge that wasn't wide enough and the concrete deck was in a bit of trouble so that we put a new cable um, on one side that allowed us to double the width of the deck with a new steel bridge here and take off the concrete of the existing bridge and put a steel deck there. And that magically meant that the cable still worked and the tower still works and you double the capacity of the bridge. Um, orthotropic deck design was pretty simple in those days. You followed standard rules um, and it wasn't a, um, uh, there was nowhere near the computing power that we've got to now. It has to be said that this bridge is the only one that's in Cologne that is still carrying trucks, only steel bridge over the Rhine in Cologne that is still carrying trucks. So that we must have done something, something right in, in design that. Tamar Bridge, a similar sort of thing. It was built in the 1960s, early 1960s. Um, uh, it had a concrete deck on, on steel stringers. It wasn't wide enough. It basically replaced the steel deck, allowed cantilevers to be placed on the outside. And, um, um, uh, and and stay cables to, to, to deal with a, a certain amount of extra load that the trust, the trust was suffering with. So those are lessons that we can use to sort of say, what can we do going forward when we look at existing structures? The other two sort of examples of, of things not to do again, um, uh, which I'll come to in a bit more detail later, where there are just critical details that get um, uh, virtually define the life of the structure that are so easily avoided. Um, uh, and you know that we that there's a great deal of sophistication that's needed in the work that we do, but there's also a great amount of attention to detail that we need. It isn't you know most of these things don't work going forward, not because of the thousandth load case that we haven't done. It's because we've missed some fundamental detail of 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 construction, and that is what has defined the life of the structure and how we should learn from the past in terms of what has what 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 has lasted and what hasn't lasted. So just, you know, the helicopter bridge that, that Pat mentioned, there were two bridges built five years apart. There was an existing arch bridge that had a new cable stay bridge beside it, and they demolished the, 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 the arch bridge, uh, or, or actually they sent it somewhere else to be used in a nice circular way. They, um, uh, uh, and then they built the new, um, uh, almost identical cable stay bridge exactly behind it. The first bridge you can see in this picture, has a, uh, a lock coil strand that is anchored off. And you saw the picture of the bypass where the corroded area was. It was at the bottom of the strand where it went through the anchor plate to a socket. There was only five millimeters of gap between the strand and the anchor plate so that the water would go down the cable to a place that you couldn't see, you couldn't paint, um, uh, and you couldn't repair and you couldn't drain. So it was in essence, a, um, uh, the reason why we are replacing those cables today for something tens of million, tens of million euro in contract is out there for that replacement. The North Bridge, for some reason, I don't know why, because they were there, they, they were any wiser, they were necessarily any wiser to, the, to the fact that that small gap was having, had left themselves about um, 40 millimeters round the strand so that you could get in there, put a little drain hole, paint it, inspect it, check that the wires weren't breaking, and that doesn't need the cable replacement. So that one decision defined the life of that bridge. Um, uh, and you see the anchor beams that we're now putting in, we're putting in new cables above and below the existing, 
because there's no redundancy in the system. So we need to put, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's a massive job to do, to do the replacement. Similar sort of thing on, on, the, on the fourth road bridge, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a function of, of suspension bridges is that whenever they, um, uh, uh, a, a truck goes across a suspension bridge, the uh, whole, the only thing that holds the, the, the deck in place is the pendulum action on the short hangers. So that for the passage of every truck on the fourth road bridge, when it's at the quarter span on one side, the whole deck has moved 25 millimeters one way. And when it's on the quarter span on the other side, it's moved 25 millimeters the other way. And that, that continual moving of, of small distance is pretty nasty for bearings, okay? So there are, you know, and, and I'm happy to say that there's a, quite a lot of these um, uh, pendle bearings around because I've replaced three of them and they've been a, quite a good line of business. A, because they don't like this particular um, sort of continual, continual movement. So the, um, uh, the one thing that you can't see on this detail here is, is, is the bearing itself, because the fixed part of the pin is on the outside and the bearing is on the, is, is on the part that you could never see. So this bearing seized probably 20, 20 years before the pendle broke and you had to shut the fourth road bridge for three weeks while you rushed the repair in and then it was only open to cars. Then about uh, three months later, you could open it to trucks again. So again, it's just a tiny attention to detail. If the bearing had been on the outside, it could have been replaced. It, you could have seen whether it was working. You could have intervened to, 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 to do these things. So it's, it's that level. These are the sorts of things that define the lives of structures, of historic structures. I would hope that we're now learning from that to go take, take details forward that work and then also to use the advances that we have both to get economic structures and durable structures going forward in, in, in what we design. These are the sorts of cracks that manifest themselves on the Dutch bridges. Um, a, uh, um, uh, I'll go into a bit more detail about how orthotropic decks have been designed historically, but they, um, they, 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 they suffer. It has largely been, you know, by force, almost like force majeure. There wasn't the computing available when these things were first contemplated to really understand the stresses that exist. And then also to have proper classifications of, of the details so that you understood the fatigue. And so that there's been sort of incremental learning of better detailing, you know, be it the, the, the type of weld that you use, the type of fit up, the type of, of, of hole through the girder. You know, the Seven Bridge was one of the first that had every trough stopping on, um, uh, uh, on every cross girder. And that, that, that all those, you know, that, that hasn't carried a truck since they opened the second bridge because it can't deal with it. Similarly, you know, the, the other steel bridge over the Rhine, apart from, from road incursion in, in Cologne, all of those can't carry a truck at the moment because of, because of those issues. So there has been incremental gains in, in understanding, but those have largely been empirical. And so, but we, you know, that there, there, there is actually now the computing power, and there is actually now a better understanding of the behavior of these things, so that you can take forward, um, you know, because we have actually have got quite a large experimental um, a bed of these eight structures that we used, uh, uh, have been analyzing in Holland, to take forward to the, um, um, to, to, to the changes that will happen in the Eurocode, and to um, uh, to other projects that are are basically seeing this is going to happen. We need to act on it now. Here's a sort of example of, again of the crack that, 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 that Pat talked about. That Achilles heel of that crack coming up through the deck plate. There's a very hard spot where every cross girder is, and um, uh, there's a there's a a, a, a hole where in, in in the web of the cross girder where the, the trough goes through. So there's a soft spot and a hard spot. That very, very tiny detail has to have a classification and an understanding of a stress that is created there to understand whether or not that crack starts and propagates. You would hear, you know, on these bridges, you know, the first, the first thing you, you might do, you might see a crack or you might actually be hearing the, the two plates of, the, of, of, of the, the crack in the deck plate having a little bit of a, a, a noise as each wheel went over. As, 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 it, as, as it brushed past its, you know, uh, 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 vertically separating the crack or not. So that you don't actually see this crack until it's probably two meters long. Um, a, um, in, 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 in the... 
And the, 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 there was a bit of a sort of an accelerated aging trial being done in Holland because they have so many more trucks and so much more traffic than other people. But in essence, it's a reality. This is happening after 30 years. It will happen after 60 years in other places, basically. It is a, um, uh, uh, it'll, it'll be a fact of life. So, and that is what we have been, you know, we have taken the, 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 or, the or, or the team, you know, both the client team, TNO, who are a sort of a, 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 they're sort of a semi-government organization, aren't they? They're, they're sort of associated with the, the, the University of Delft, Technical University of Delft. Um, I think they, they're largely get government related projects. I think that there was a, a, an equivalent in the UK called the Transport Research Laboratory, but it, it's, it's much more technically related um, uh, um, TNO that, you know, they're, they're very much into the drafting of Euro codes and understanding of the science of, of, of construction and engineering. And so that they have, that they, they have actually been on the drafting committee of, of the next standard of, of, of the Euro code. But in essence, they're taking the methodology that we've used to really post justify the concrete overlay solution that Pat was talking about, and also to, to justify pure steel solutions on new bridges um, uh, uh, that, 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 that so that people in, in, in the future can do advanced analytical methods, have a proper classification of, of, of welds such that you can understand how long these things are going to last. And we have actually, you know, that um, John here will be recognize the picture. Um, in the, we have actually been taking this, this work, you know, before the, the publication of this code, we believe it's the, um, uh, the science of the moment, the state of the art to the rest of the world to say, you need to be looking at bridges in this way um, uh, to understand, to, to make sure that they last a hundred years. And um, the uh, one, one of one of the one, one of the countries, you know, it it, it is surprising to think of, but with the, the you know there, there's there's nowhere near the traffic volumes in Norway, and then simply one of the crucial factors in the behaviour of these decks is the temperature of the asphalt, because the hotter the asphalt, the less far the, the wheel loads disperse. Um, a and there, you know, that for the Dutch bridges, for for example. Um, nearly sort of, you know, something like 80% of the damage to the um, uh, fatigue damage, calculated fatigue damage happened in temperatures during the summer months versus the 20% during the winter months because of that effect of the asphalt. But even in Norway, a, um, uh, uh, when, when, when we look at the, the traffic volumes, and there's quite a lot of, of truck traffic associated with timber and things like that that's heavy. There, even in Norway, um, uh, it is colouring. The, the, these things are significantly colouring the thickness of steel deck plate that you need. Um, not only that, they're attempting some um, uh, unbelievable structures at the moment in Norway that, that we that we are we are we're working with them on. The um, you know the, this, for instance, it looks like a convention. It's only only a twelve hundred meter span um, uh, uh, suspension bridge. But they want to make the deck out of aluminium. Um, so aluminium, you know, the, the uh, it, they, they have actually done a couple of, of of shorter span bridges in aluminium. But the the logic of this is that a um, uh, that the the the, 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 the there's zero maintenance in, in theory in the future. There is a, a gain to be made in the in the cable, and there's a gain to be made in the tower, and a gain to be made in the anchorage. As we said, the tower is a bit minimal because that's normally defined by the freestanding tab before you put the bridge on. Um, uh, but the rest, there is a lot. There's also a theoretical carbon gain because uh, Norway is Europe's um, uh, biggest producer of aluminium and it uses its hydroelectricity to, gen to, 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 to produce that um, aluminium. And um, uh, then similarly, there, there is an advantage to, uh, if, they, if you're spending money on infrastructure, you need to, uh, it's, it, as, as a sort of a, a regenerative, you know, the, the regenerative aspects of spending money on in infrastructure, it needs to be, um, uh, it's better if it's done locally. So aluminium has, ha has a, had a checkered past on fatigue, you know, the comet aircraft falling out of the sky being one. Um, uh, and so, and we are going prototype almost with a, a 1200 meter span bridge here. So there is, there will be a steel alternative in the tender for the contractors. And I, I strongly suspect the contractors will not want to take the risk, but we will see where that comes. But exactly the same um, advanced analytical tools that were developed for the understanding of fatigue in those bridges in the Netherlands 
is being used on these um, aluminium decks with wheel loads on them. Um, uh, Similarly, there, there's a, this is a five kilometre long floating bridge um, uh, uh, in, uh, in Norway that is in detailed design at the moment. The, uh, again, a, um, uh, you know, the fatigue is, is a probability based issue, you know, that not everything has, you know, when you do a, 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 when you do a tensile test on an element, it will fail at 355 or it'll yield at 35 or thereabouts almost every time. Your fatigue life of a, of, of a sample will have a very broad spread of a normal distribution of, of, of chances of failure. So you say, okay, well, so there's a bit, you know, we're, we're basing it on probability of load or probability of failure of the well. But on this thing, this is five kilometers of, of, um, um, uh, of, of deck here. There will be about 70,000 of these Achilles heel details where the crack propagates under, from the deck plate up through a trough at a cross girder position. We're rolling that dice 70,000 times. And a, um, uh, <laughs> the, the truth will light, I'm afraid, the truth will light. It, it, you need them. So, 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 so there's that. You say, okay, we're spending a huge amount of money to generate a link all the way up the west side of Norway. Um, to to allow traffic to um, um, uh, to, 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 to 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 avoid it's called the ferry free route to avoid the to, to not use ferries to cross that route and, and create a reliable infrastructure along along the west side of Norway. They 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 you know they are are taking a very sort of um, uh, uh, they want to be absolutely certain that this 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 route will last a hundred years and that the money they spend today that they they have because they have the wealth from 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 oil and the like will ensure that future life in, in, in the future so, so there is a, a a demand for this to be certain to last a hundred life hundred year life and so that they they want to use the the, the most up-to-date methods of analysis to prove that there's a competing thing here on actual just straight feasibility in SPA that this will be pushing up the thickness of the deck plate when we do the fatigue analysis of this. But the floating stability and the dynamic stability of this bridge is um, um, a, uh, uh, it, it's, 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 it, I can't pretend to understand it actually. So I'll just say it's complicated. <laughs> so a, uh, it is a um, uh, it, it is absolutely contingent on the weight of the deck, and so you've got competing demands here. So we need to be absolutely targeting the right decision for what is the the, the minimum thickness that we need um, for these things, but is definitely safe. And then just you know that there is actually this probably we we, we are at detailed design level with um, we are the de detailed design team with the client is actually the detailed designer so the local the the, the roads authority in Norway is 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 is, is, is the designer our Jacobson are the designer and we are the designers as a consortium for this suspension bridge which is the um, will be. Um, the longest in in Europe, I think it's the 16, uh, 16 50, I think it's one meter longer than store about um, by chance. Mm. A um, as as a main span. So this is the one where they're they're they're, they're almost um, uh, um, designing what will become the standard uh, uh, orthotropic deck in um, uh, uh, for, for the rest of the structures that they're contemplating. And this gives you a little idea of of the geometry. It's a relatively you know. Conventional section. Um, this is this. They, 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 they're sticking with steel for this one. A um, uh, with it, with it, with these truss 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 frames within. But in essence, they it, it, it is uh, because of the demand on on those. There, there's varying deck plate thickness that's going to be used on the slow lane, the fast lane, and the areas that don't see traffic. Um, so that you're optimizing the, the structure in, in in that respect. The whole thing is sort of modeled in BIM. Um, uh, which for people I mean makes it bloody hard to check. Um, it is a, uh, a, but it is the whole thing is one of the is, is incredibly powerful. This actually in the way in which they've done it, it really grows organically as you're doing it. Um, it is a, it, it is definitely the way because it then feeds into the way in which Pat was saying how you create the re records that then become how you look after a bridge, how you understand it, how you can keep it going, and what you need to look at. And it will have all of the records of what um, eventually have all of the records of what um, uh, you've done to, to, to build the bridge and, and, the, and the quality associated with that. 
going back into a bit of history here, you know, that I said that it was largely an empirical process. I think people pretended what they was happening, they understood what was happening in the design for fatigue of decks um, uh, uh, but before the advent of computers, where you broke things down into saying, oh, this is how far a, 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 a drop will deflect, and this is how far a deck plate will defect, uh, deflect. And you, there was, I think it was probably uh, with a low torsional stiff, uh, stiffness of flat plate stiffeners, it probably was enough because the, the testing out of on the basis of global stresses was probably enough to deal with the the, the consequences of of the local action. But as soon as the trough stiffener arrived, as almost like the default um, stiffener, the very very local stresses that govern the, the, the life of a structure are not captured. And they really are, um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, even in, a, it says in the past and in the present here, it actually, in the past is actually what we, what nearly everyone does today. And in the, and in the present is what people will have to do from today going forward um, um, or, or gradually pick up. A, um, uh, whereby we had a sort of a, a, a beam model and a frame model, even a 2D shell element model that got us to global or, or um, stresses in, in 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 elements that told us the um, that you could then compare with a um, uh, uh, you know th this ignores all the stress concentrations associated with the details or or it clusters them in things that have been tested that were very much um, covering a wide band of 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 of, of behaviours that I think. Really, that it was it was coming through in almost I was mentioning it in empirical methods. This had worked on previous bridges. It, um, uh, uh, but what one was never getting into the level of detail that one needs to understand where a crack starts and where it then runs to in um, in, in in a real steel bridge. And you see on the picture on the right, um, you are having to understand how the stress profile varies in the uh, in, in the welds or in in the joint. At, at, a, at, at any individual connection, such that you are, 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 are able to correlate that with something of a very similar nature that's been um, uh, tested to give you a fit fatigue life based on the actual peak stress that you have in your model, rather than on um, uh, a, uh, an overall stress due to a bending in the stiffener or a bending in a plate that you've calculated from, from much more coarse, coarse effects. There is a huge amount of computing involved in this, um, uh, and I, I would normally not advocate um, a huge amount of computing that you need to understand the answer before you start. But in this instance, you really have to get down to the level at which you understand the, um, um, uh, the, the nature of stress in its really local details to understand whether it's going to crack or not. The Eurocodes, in some respect, you, we, we, we were being forced down into sort of more refined, you know, that is giving you a, a realistic picture of, of life. And then so you drop back to say, well, if that's giving us a realistic picture of life, why aren't a whole mass more bridges failing at the moment? And the, the real answer to that is that truck loading in the Eurocodes is a hugely, is, is hugely larger than the truck loading that most bridges see. You know, not all trucks are full. Um, a uh, uh, you know the, 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 if you see here this this, this we, we 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 did a, a we we created a our own fatigue model load model for this bridge in Norway on the basis of a way in motion. But you'll see if you look at the the the, the axle weights of 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 the vehicles on the heavy side. Okay, it goes up to 120. I think as you see is the highest there. There's 190 axle ton, 190 kilonewton axle in the Eurocode is is in the same thing. So that a that that just doesn't exist on the network at the moment. It, um, and that and, and then when you look at how often that is applied in a standard lane, it is almost 40 percent of the trucks that are seen to travel on the bridge. So that there needs to be a realism in the trucks that you in 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 your loads, if you are to actually get to a reasonable number. I mean, to say this bridge has stood up, for, but it's only had this amount of thickness of deck, of, of deck plate. If we if we start on a new bridge and use the mirror code um, for sea landing, and that probably needs to be developed at a national level in each country to say, you know, Holland will be very close to the euro code loading. Norway is substantially less. UK will be substantially less. Ireland will be substantially less in terms of the demand on the structure. And so it is it is covered to to some degree in 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 in, 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 in the national annexes, 
but it's worth a look, you know, that there will be a, a challenge to look at it in more detail when these revised requirements come out for the um, um, uh, for, for, for the euro codes. And just to say how this is done, you know, that the, a, a very local model is inserted into the bridge. A, um, uh, you know, that about almost a million elements go in, go, 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 go in there to, to create that. But that is a really establishing a very fine mesh detail um, uh, uh, where, 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 where the loading patterns are. And a 100 kilonewton axle is passed over this in multiple positions so that you can get the, both the passage of the vehicle and the chance of it being in any position in the lane um, as, 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 as it goes across, across the ridge. Um, by superposition, you can create the load history that um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, or at least understanding the, the, or I think it's a bit later, understanding the, the influence line of, 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 of any particular detail, you can then establish a stress history due to the passage of any truck and also the, the, any truck in a variable position across the width of the bridge. But it's a, it's, it's, it's hugely demanding in computing time, but if that process is automated and it will be relatively uniform in terms of what one does, I think where, where this probably falls down is about that you know, this, this, is, this, this is a useful tool or, or, or definitely applicable to um, uh, the design of a, of a, of a 1.6 kilometer long bridge. If you've got a lifting span that's only 50 meters, it's a great deal of work to prove what you need for that. And so you may need to take some conservative decisions rather than do the analysis. But in essence, there's a, you know, that you, you one goes down in terms of modeling down to the actual weld itself. Um, uh, 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 so, so that you're going to, to actually model where, you know, the, 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 the weld itself, as well as the, the, um, um, uh, 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 the, 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 the intersecting plates. And you can see that, yeah, that, that, uh, and, and then the, the areas in red are the areas where you're picking up stress for, to establish your stress profile um, for the, the stress concentration as you, that you, as you extrapolate it into the weld to understand that and how that has been then related. Because those are the places that one was able to put stress strain, strain monitoring in the fatigue tests that were actually done in the labs. So that they they can then be correlated to the areas in which you um, actually have information on cracking, and so it does actually also produce pretty good graphics as to where you've got your issues. Um, uh, it's exploded a few myths insofar that we always thought that it was a good idea to have a mouse hole at the bottom of uh, troughs where the, the trough line so you only connect into the web. It was actually creating where that that the the trough where, where the connection to the trough ended. Was creating more problems than just actually welding it all the way around. Um, st still going straight through, but a continuous weld all the way around. And it also allows you to look at the non, you know, the um, uh, the details that aren't actually just specific to to autotropic decks, but you know the, the local connections in the in the truss itself. And you know, able to, to actually visualize in terms of well, the, 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 I mentioned that the, the, the inference line is what you use to, to um, uh, create the, the loading history for a multiple axle, multiple uh, um, position of, 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 of wheels transversely. Those are what you use to create the stress history. And then um, uh, uh, in, in establishing the damage, it is actually um, extracted as a, as, a, as a fatigue level of damage at each location. So you can actually see if you need to address it by some sort of design intervention, where you need to put the material, where you need to, 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 to deal with the detail um, as, 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 as a visualization. And so at the end of the day, you can see um, in, in our final design, we've only got a few areas where we're not at infinite life of, 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 of the structure. And that's resulted in a, actually in a 20 thick deck plate and a nine mil trough in the heavy lane and two millimeters off that for the, slow, for the fast lane. So just sort of to summarize a, a, um, a, a bit of what we've both said here, I know that the, the safety and reliability of of these structures is well that the structures is is fundamental to to to, to what we do. The um um a um uh, you know that the, the, there is a 
there, there's two elements to that. There's, there's, there's making sure that we understand what we need to do going forward and we understand what exists as, as the state of the art of the technology in, 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 in why things work as they are or don't work as they are and where we need to intervene. There is scope for technical, there's always scope for technical innovation. There is, there is always, and I, and I would actually say, particularly in the renovation of structures, I've spent half my career repairing structures and it definitely has posed more challenges than the blank piece of paper part of, of engineering um, because the, the structure, when you first look at it, it normally says it, it should have fallen down before and then you have to understand why not. Um, but there's always there's always a challenge there to to to, to think, and also to um, and then on the sustainability side, it has to last. When we build something new, it has to last. And when we consider where we need to to, to whether we need to replace something or repair something, we need to to be using the, the best our best efforts to make sure that's the minimum intervention, but also maximising the use of what is already there, so that we're not putting it defining it to the scrap heap too soon. Just like me. Yeah, and, uh, thanks. So I think we're now open for questions. <laughs>